And we close this Scrum Master Certification Series with how to get started. I've left this one to the very last because I think it is a, an excellent way to close the series because now that you've been through the entire Scrum Master Certification preparation, you are very Scrum literate. And therefore, if you're not already using Scrum in your organization, you're probably anxious to get started again after completing this series. So how do we get started? Well, the answer is there is no one right way to get started using Scrum. Some organizations will start very small. Some will pick a medium sized implementation or there is even the concept of go all in. Yesterday we were traditional. Today we're 100% Scrum. In this series, we'll discuss the pros and cons of the various approaches. We'll talk about how you get your Scrum expertise. You can grow it through self-education. You can hire people and with Scrum experience and bring them into the organization. Or you can bring in consultants who will provide that, that training and support and then leave once your company is up to speed. We will discuss whether your first Scrum projects should be public with high visibility or whether your first Scrum projects should be private, i.e. done under the covers without a lot of publicity, and then once they're done, announce the successes. We'll discuss the concept of whether a pilot is or is not a good idea, and concepts of, of what is an appropriate project. And finally, we'll close this nugget with a discussion on what are the next steps of how to ensure Scrum is going to move forward once we've got it started, how do we ensure Scrum continues in the organization? So a lot of organizations as they're beginning to roll Scrum out will make a decision. Are we going to start very small with one team? Will we go medium sized with six teams? And six being a relative term, or will we go large in that it's all in. Yesterday we were traditional, today we're Scrum. Most First blush opinions will be small is the right way to go. Small is certainly the right way to go because it's cheaper, but is less noticeable. So again, if you start off with a very small scrum implementation with only one team, there isn't a lot of expense, there isn't a lot of training, there isn't a lot of overhead and learning curve built, built into your first scrum engagement because you're only dealing with one team, six to seven people. So therefore the overall expense to the project, to the organization is far less. But the problem with starting small is it's absolutely less noticeable. If you have a, an IT organization of let's say 50 people and you put a single team into Scrum, the impact that that single team is gonna have is gonna be very tiny in relationship to the overall organization and therefore Although your Scrum project may be very, very powerful and the message may be very positive that the Scrum project worked successfully, the overall impact is going to be far less. Very similar, success should be a lot easier. You only have six to seven people to try to train. You only have six to seven people to try to support. You only have one business and product owner to encourage to be Scrum-like. But same as smaller is cheaper, it's also less important. Only one small project has been successfully delivered with Scrum. So therefore, is this project, is Scrum a success because it was Scrum? Or was this just a successful project? Because let's face it, we always have some projects that are successful. So maybe small isn't best. What's the options? medium. So instead of going small with one team, maybe we go with six teams, 10 teams, whatever is going to be appropriate for the overall size of your organization. Obviously, the larger our commitment to Scrum, the cost is going to go up, but the impact is going to go up. Success is going to be a little bit harder. There's more people to train but the overall impact of the success should be far more noticeable in the organization. There is no right or wrong answer. And as we said, some organizations, and certainly not the norm, but it has been done. Some organizations will simply say, we've done our research, we've reviewed Scrum, we appreciate Scrum, we want to be Scrum-like. 
we realize there's a lot of resistance. There's a lot of, of, of negativity around Scrum. We don't want to give the traditionalist. We don't want the PMO. We don't want to give all of the naysayers a chance to say, oh, it was just a, a, a one hit wonder. We're going to commit the organization and we're going to ensure that our organization goes Scrum. So if we go all the way, large removes the competition, the PMO, the traditionalists, the other business areas. Everybody is going to be involved in the Scrum and therefore it ensures co full cooperation because the, the business and IT is either going to be participatory in the Scrum project or they're literally not in the organization anymore. What's the right answer for your organization? Again, a lot of instances, small is the preferred way to go. And that's pretty traditional with everything we do. We like to take small steps first and then larger steps. And then we start to run and so on and so on and so on. Implementing Scrum is typically no different. It's cheaper, it's easier, but it has less impact. But if we go small, small should create the champions. So therefore, again, maybe less noticeable, maybe less important, but if we then have six to seven people on our team as champions, talking to people at lunch breaks, talking to people in the lunchroom, talking to people when they're in business meetings saying, I just finished this awesome scrum project. It was incredible. We delivered results to the business ha faster. The business was happier than I've ever seen the business, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, whether it is small, we're creating champions and we're then gonna spread the good word and small has less risk, which should position Scrum more correctly. Simply again, we can focus on, we can spend the time and attention to make sure this first small engagement is going to be a total success. Now, you may come into this segment saying, Steve says small is the right way to go. Almost. Steve thinks there's a lot of merits for small and I've tried to bring all of those merits out in this segment of the nugget, but I also believe there is this whole impact consideration for small. And if you're in a very large organization and you start too small, it's gonna take a long time. Yes, the small project was a success, but we have lots of other projects were a success. Was the small project a success because it was Scrum, or was the small project a success because we have successful projects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So medium is not a bad idea if you have the resources to commit to it. And as I said, rarely, but on occasions, and salesforce.com was one of the, the glowing examples of an all-in approach where they literally bet the firm, remove the competition, and it ensures full cooperation. Bottom line, your organization is going to need to select the approach that best satisfies the unique requirements of your organization. So really independent of the small, medium, large decision, assuming you're introducing Scrum into your organization for the first time, you need to determine where you're gonna get your skills for Scrum. And, you know, as with needing any skills in an organization, you have to make a, a grow, as in educate, and train? Are you going to hire people with the skills into your organization? Or are you gonna bring in consultants to do the rapid ramp up and then knowledge transfer and then removal? Growth, training, education is very slow, but it absolutely shows organizational commitment. You are trusted, valued resources in our organization we want you to continue to be trusted, valued or resources in our organization, and therefore we're investing substantial dollars in you to become Scrum experts. In my humble opinion, you need to have some element, a certain percentage of growth no matter what. Hiring is an absolute fast start, but my concern about too aggressive of hiring is I believe it risks alienation. It risks alienation because, okay, new guys or gals 
where does that leave me? There's not more money in the organization. There's not more dollars to commit to projects. So if the organization just went out and hired five seasoned scrum experts, people are going to do the math and says five new scrum experts coming in. That means over time, probably five of the existing project delivery resources are going back out the door in one form or another. It's, there's the risk for alienation simply because people get concerned about job security. And there is a risk of alienation depending on the personalities of the new hires. They may come in with a bit of a, I'm, I'm going to use the word chip on their shoulder, but I'm, I'm not sure it's exactly the right, right uh, phrase to be using. But they come in with this attitude that, hmm, I'm the scrum expert. I get a chance to show this organization how to be scrum-like. I'm going to lord it over everybody in the organization. So not only do we have people worried about where their jobs are going, they're also worried about dealing with these aggressive personalities trying to roll out and support scrum. So typically there will be some hiring, I would say a very small percentage to help us get started recognizing that there's a lot of risks with the higher approach and there's probably a requirement to bring in some degree of i'm going to say high priced help bring in a consultant who has skills to do the knowledge transfer kt doesn't necessarily have the same degree of alienation because a consul good consultant shouldn't come in with the attitude of i'm the expert I'm going to teach this poor, impoverished organization how to be scrum-like. The consultants are going to come in with the consultative mindset that says, I'm here to do knowledge transfer. I'm here to help you. I'm here to, to ensure your success. And then I leave. And therefore, when the consultant leaves, there is no issue with the, okay, who's, whose job is at risk? It's the consultant's job that is at risk. As soon as they do a good job of the knowledge transfer, they're out the door and the internal growth has, has happened appropriately. So again, I would expect for anyone beginning to implement Scrum into the organization, you probably need to have some percentage of training and education grow internally. Probably, at least in Steve's humble opinion, a very small percentage of hiring to bring in and shore up on a permanent basis and considerable expenditure on consultants to do the rapid skills transfer, recognizing that when the consultant walks out the door, if you have not had good transfer done, then all of the skills are walking out the door. So again, although this is, is typically a very common way to do the ramp up, we need to focus very much on ensuring that we have appropriate knowledge transfer in place. Probably the most significant decision you have to make, at least in my humble opinion, of introducing Scrum is whether you want your introduction of Scrum to be public with a lot of fanfare and a lot of scrutiny, or whether you want your introduction of Scrum to be private, whereby you simply go out and find a team, form them up, find the business area that's interested, and ask them to develop a project using Scrum basis without any fanfare, with as, as little knowledge of, of the action as possible, and then announce it when the project is a success. So private, as I said, flies under the radar until success is declared, and then we go very public to announce the success of Scrum. The alternative to that, or the opposite to that is, public ensures everybody is watching, public announces that this organization has taken innovative steps to become more aggressive and more responsive to software development and gets a lot of attention on the project. So, very different approaches, polar opposite approaches. The beauty of private is it flies under the radar. If it fails, we very quietly lick our wounds and say, why did it fail? We'd still do the retrospective. We'd still look for ways that we can, can make it work the next time. But it's all been done in a very private way. And I don't mean, you know, in an illegal, immoral, don't tell the CEO about it. 
but don't do a large corporate announcement of it. And if it fails, we look for ways to improve, look to fix, try again, and hope in the second time that we're able to declare success. The biggest issue I have with the private approach is it gives us the easy way out. If it fails, a lot of organizations will say, well, we tried, it failed, I guess Scrum isn't for us, there's no visibility, there's no one watching it, there's no one, you know, just waiting for an announcement. So we can just basically say another failed project, we're sorry, and don't even attribute it to Scrum, and just say we're taking, taking measures to, to a deal with it, as with any other number of failed projects. So to me, again, the big issue with the private is it gives us the easy way out. If there's one benefit that I believe of going public with Scrum is, is just, again, the opposite. It doesn't give us the easy way out. There's people watching. And therefore, if there's people watching, I hope we're going to try harder and we're going to ensure within our powers to ensure success. So if you're asked for Steve's humble opinion of whether public or private is the is which of the best way to go, I personally believe public is the way to go. I like people watching. I like people aware of the fact that I'm making taking steps to improve my organizational efficiency and project delivery. And I like the scrutiny that it's going to put onto my team to ensure that I try my very hardest and I ensure success. And if this is one of those projects that was doomed to fail no matter what we try, then we will also be very public with the failure and the reasons and why we're going to keep trying Scrum. Because let's face it, projects fail for any of hundreds of reasons. Scrum, as we've discussed throughout the series, eliminates many of those reasons, but maybe the project failed because of inappropriate technology. Maybe the project failed because the government legislation that we are about to support has been repealed by, by Congress. There's lots of reasons why projects fail. The projects may fail for reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with Scrum. So we announce why we failed, why we believe Scrum is still important, and why we're going to keep trying to use Scrum to again ensure our process improvement for more successful project delivery. Whether you choose to call your first attempt at Scrum a pilot, or whether you choose to call your first attempt at Scrum your first attempt at Scrum, there is a, a fair degree of nuance with the differences. And whether you consider you're going to do a small implementation of Scrum, is a small implementation of Scrum considered to be synonymous to a pilot? I would suggest no. A small implementation of Scrum is a small team. Six to seven people, one team. That's not a pilot. That's just a very cautious initiation of the Scrum process. To me, a pilot is a very focused attempt at showing results. And in order to do that, we need to very carefully consider what the characteristics of a good pilot is. And the characteristics of a good pilot is it needs to be an important project. It needs to have some attention, but it should not be a mission critical project. And often those two characteristics of a pilot cannot often be implemented in a small implementation of Scrum a small one per, or one person, a small one team adaptation of Scrum with six to seven people probably doesn't have enough person power to get an important but not critical project done. So now we're starting already to move into the medium sized approach to implementation of Scrum. 
Similar to that, a pilot project should not be too small because again, if it's too small, it gets lost. The same concept we were talking about why small implementations may not be the most appropriate simply because it needs to have enough visibility, but it doesn't want to be too large that it has a long time frame. If we have a lot of people watching our pilot focused attempt and showing results, we want to get results in, I would say, six months. If our scrum pilot takes much more than six months, people are going to get bored with it and lose attention. Or conversely, people are going to say, oh, guess that scrum thing's not working. They told me it was supposed to be faster and nimble and more agile. It's now 10 months and the pilot still hasn't finished. I guess scrum isn't very agile. Well, if the pilot itself was supposed to take 12 months, it's still going to be done in 12 months, but people lose interest in the pilot. In order for a pilot to be a success, absolutely I believe the business and the product owner has to be on board. They have to be the biggest champions to scrum in our organization because they have to have the commitment, they have to have the drive, they have to have the dedication to ensure this project pilot project is a success and the team has to be respected. The team has to have a voice in the organization. If we're going to seed our pilot with a bunch of new hires and a bunch of consultants, the pilot may be 100% success, but the organization is not going to buy into the pilot because they don't know who was the reason for the success. Was it the new hires? Was it the consultants? But if the team has the respect of the organization, i.e. current team members, organizational employees who have the knowledge of, who have the interest of, who have the support of the organization, your pilot is going to have a lot more success. Whether you choose to call it a pilot or not, again, is however, how you position it in your organization. Typically, pilots are terms that are used for new attempts. And I'll again focus on using the word attempt, showing results. In a lot of organizations, they choose not to use the term pilot. They simply say, Scrum is an established process. Our organization is now getting on the Scrum bandwagon and we're going to have a medium-sized attempt. There are now six teams who have been trained in Scrum and we're going to begin to deliver projects using Scrum. Doesn't change the focus, doesn't change the importance, doesn't change the value of rolling out Scrum. It simply changed the impetus of, we now have six to seven teams doing Scrum and that may be across three projects. One very small project with a single team, one project with, a, with two teams, and a very large project with three teams, or so on and so on. So again, often because Scrum is so well established, we don't have to go through the formality of calling it a pilot. We simply say, we're going with a six to seven team implementation of Scrum, and in fact, that's going to cover three different projects. Whether you start small, whether you start medium, whether you start large, whether you use public display of scrumness, or whether you choose to be more private in adaptation of scrum, whether you choose to call your first foray into scrum a pilot, or whether you simply say, we're starting, is all going to be based on your own organizational dynamics, your own organizational requirements, and literally what politically will be most acceptable into your organization. So now you're a few months into Scrum in your organization, you're having some success. What are the next steps? How do we ensure that Scrum continues to be supported in our organization? Again, the, the, the approach is going to be as, as unique as every organization that you work for. Some people simply say, repeat until everybody is a believer. So we have six to seven teams that did work for finance and marketing. When they're done finance and marketing, let's repeat that six to seven teams and let's go into the warehouse 
and into um, distribution or sales. And when we're done in distribution and sales, then let's go into HR and so on. So take that same team and repeat their success throughout the organization. Not a bad approach. You've got a team of seasoned people who are getting better and better at being scrum every day and sell those teams into various other parts of the organization until the overall organization is a believer and no one wants to delude traditional development. Maybe the best approach is to divide and conquer. So you take your team that has six to seven people in it and you simply say two people go to team new one and we'll add four green beans. Take another two people and go it into team new two with four green beans and take the other two people and again divide and conquer. Whether we continue to take this pseudo inexperienced team and continue to work in finance and marketing or whether we take the pseudo green team and move into other organizational units. So again, a, 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 a combination of divide and conquer. Take the skills and seed and train new people in your organization and continue to repeat the exploration or expansion into the organization until everybody is a believer. Again, will de depend on the organizational dynamics. Absolutely, I believe your next steps is continued education. Scrum takes hours to understand and years to master. And I'm not trying to repeat myself for the sake of repeating myself, but on on ongoing education and seminars and training is absolutely critical to continue to get better at being Scrum-like. And I would encourage you, and I don't think I need to do a lot of encouragement because you're taking this series because it is focused on Scrum Master Certification to continue to do your certification, to take advanced levels of certification yourself, and to encourage other people in your organization to become certified. There's more certification than just Scrum Master. You can become certified business owner. You can become certified product owner. You can become certified team member. And you can become education specialist, where you become coaches. So absolutely, to continue Scrum in your organization, encourage education, training, and certification. And without repeating a nugget we've already had, ensure that your organization focuses on Scrum process improvement on a continual basis. This concludes our nugget on how to get started in Scrum. In this nugget, we focused on how to start. Do we start small? and address the pros and cons. Small is, is cheap, it's efficient, it's low risk, but it has lower impact. Maybe we need to go a little bit bigger with not just a single team, but with six teams, a little more cost, a little more effort, a little more risk, but a little more results, or do we go large as an all-in? Yesterday, we were traditional. Tomorrow, we're scrum-like. Absolutely bets the farm on success, but Believe it or not, the large all-in approach is going to get the highest level of support and highest level of adoption from everybody in the organization because they literally have no choice but to support it. We talked about where and how you're going to get your scrum skills. Do you grow them through education and training? Do we hire new people into the organization or do we bring in consultants to do knowledge transfer? And the answer is, probably a little bit of both, with the ratio being appropriate for your own organizational dynamics. We discussed whether it's best, as we're introducing Scrum, to be go very public and get all eyes on your Scrum implementation, or whether it's better to be a little less public and simply select a small team and an a, a, a incented business owner and develop one project through Scrum, literally under the covers, under the radar, and then announce success. Private has far less focus, but my concern with private is it is also far easier to give up. I personally support the public approach because then the pressure is on for us to succeed. And when the pressure is on to succeed, we're more likely to succeed. We discussed whether implementing a pilot is appropriate in your organization, where we pick a important 
but not critical. Project, not too small, but not too big to show how Scrum can be a success in our organization. And finally, we talked about the next steps, which is continual improvement and training. With this nugget, we also complete our Scrum Master Certification. Through the 27 nuggets in this series, I hope I have given you enough knowledge and understanding and practical application of what Scrum is to help you be successful with implementing Scrum in your organization. And I absolutely have given you the material that you need to go forth and to take the next step in your Scrum Master certification process, which is the in-person training program. And then immediately after that, go and take and pass your Scrum Master certification. Whether you're taking this nugget series for Scrum Master certification, I wish you luck with Scrum Master certification, or whether you're taking this series to understand what Scrum is and to how to more successfully implement Scrum in your organization, again, I wish you great success with adapting and implementing Scrum into your organization. This concludes our nugget on how to get started with Scrum. I hope this module has been informative for you, and thank you very much for viewing.